when we were thinking about this particular session, one of the things that crossed our minds was truly how do providers effectively advance the screening and prevention efforts in areas that have various resources. And of course, we heard that from all of our speakers today. But I'd like to start off just with um, something that came to mind what, during Dr. Paskett's um, presentation. When you develop that model and you actually hand them the manual, um, clearly there's either education gaps or communication gaps that sometimes come into play. So what did you do in that situation when you built it, you delivered it, you developed it, you handed the manual, and so many of you talked about different partnerships. And I liked the comment about eventually, you know, at any time, somebody that you're partnering with should be able to trumpet and take it and run with it, because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to build these coalitions. So if you could speak to that. Well, uh, we explained to them that we, we had, um, you know, in the resource manual or is all the equipment to get the women to the sessions, do the inreach, et cetera, and that the women knew what day to come, where to come, et cetera. It was going to be very easy. We even had the outlines for the, the material that would be presented, and they still wouldn't do it because it was different from what they currently were doing. It was out, something foreign to them. Even though they knew and were partners with us in the whole endeavor, they just didn't feel they had the capacity to take it over. Did they think of that at that time or think that as you were doing it that you were going to stay forever or that it wouldn't be handed off for them to continue, do you think? I think so, okay. yeah. They kind of saw this as something that the academic institution was doing and that it really wasn't in their purview, which, you know, I, I disagree totally with. Right. Um, but it's hard to know how to convince people, you know, mm -hmm. in the face of their own limited resources. Mm -hmm. I just think it's great because we still can see more lessons learned as we go through these processes. So just so you don't think that was a total failure. No, not <laughs> at all. Uh, I was uh, highlighting it because you did such a wonderful job and that, I thought it was a great lesson learned. That, that whole focus uh, program is on our tips, uh, resource tested intervention programs on Cancer Control Planet. And for years it had be, been the number one downloaded screening program. Um, on the program. So it is being used by other folks, not just... Correct. Thank you very much. Do we have a question? Yeah, I actually had two questions. Great presentations all around. Um, this one's for Felicia. Felicia, um, I um, wanted to talk... To, um, at, what I heard from you about Mexico was that the treatment and some of that was in place in terms of coverage and what I see a lot in the, some of the lower resource countries is that prevention is being promoted without screening and treatment or treatment in place. Do you have any advice in the order of, of how that should be progressed or should it be going at the same time? And then two, my question was about, I understand that cervical cancer screening is being considered as a universal health coverage indicator and if you've heard that or not. So on the first one, um, I don't have the answer on order. Um, just like I, I don't actually have the answer as to whether or not it's right that some cancers go into a fund before others. It's an extremely difficult decision, and I've watched decision makers have to make it when you say we'll include acute lymphoblastochemia and leukemia in children, but not other cancers, for example. You, you have to do it based on evidence as to what you think will achieve the lowest, or the, rather the, the greatest gain in mortality and the reduction in morbidity. But it's never an easy thing to do. And when I think you're actually in the field doing it, you don't apply it that way. You don't, you don't choose people. Um, that said, I think there's an important point about should we do um, screening and early detection if there isn't sufficient treatment in place? And I very strongly believe yes. And the reason is that denying people information about the fact that they have a disease simply means denying a country a voice to do something towards getting the resources to have that treatment and the right to health. Um, denying information only puts a country back in terms of getting to universal health coverage. So I do believe very strongly in early detection and sharing information even where treatment is not completely there. Now, all of that said, in not all but in many cancers, there, are, there is treatment that's low cost and low intervention and treatment that's much more difficult to implement. So it isn't an, um, an all or nothing 
argument in terms of treatment. The fact that we happen to be so lucky as to have Herceptin in the package in Mexico doesn't mean that if we didn't, we shouldn't be offering some kind of treatment. It's a continuum, um, if that's part of the answer. And then the point on using cervical cancer as an indicator for universal health coverage, I'm actually, we're having a meeting later today with the PAHO precisely to begin to talk about some of the indicators that might be most sensitive um, to thinking about universal health coverage. And I think that this is a very good one. I also think that access to pain control and palliative care um, is probably one of the most sensitive indicators that we could use in terms of universal health coverage. Because around the world, when I look at countries that supposedly have universal health coverage, including Mexico, and I find out that there's no access to morphine, I have trouble continuing to say that we have universal health coverage. So I think it's a good one, and I think we have to think it through. It's not the only one. Another question? Uh, hi, this is Greta Massetti from the CDC again. I really appreciated this panel and, and the theme around um, kind of social context and historical context. And I think uh, all of you talked about um, involvement and partnership and engagement of the local community. And I would like for all of you to, to kind of comment on kind of how the importance and um, value of part of that engagement, meaning having individuals who are representatives of the community you're working with be the actual practitioners on the front line and what that can add in terms of that cultural awareness um, versus having uh, mental health, uh, or I mean health practitioners from academic centers or from, from different communities and how you can, um, how, how that, what that adds to it. Thanks. Um, that's an interesting question because in some places we don't have any choice. There are no other providers out there. And, but you do get situations where, um, for example, in, in a lot of low-income countries in Africa where government health workers are transferred out of the area that they're familiar with. That sometimes makes a distance between them and the communities they're trying to serve. Um, there are some limits to that by language. Um, but if there's a common language throughout the country, but different cultures, that can be a, a concerning factor. But I think it's more than just whether you're part of the community. Health workers are already advantaged by education and probably by income over some of the people in their community. And so they may, that may create some distances that we need to overcome when we're thinking about these services because it is more than just language, religion, there are many aspects of this and, uh, that we need to consider. And I think that comes back to training also. In pre-service training, when people are going through their training, that we can't focus only on the biological, the biomedical, but we have to include these social cultural elements in our training so that people are sensitized and have a chance to realize the impact they have on, on how they work with the communities they're trying to serve. So I'm going to direct my comments on this question just to the Appalachian region. Um, so um, it, 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 the coalitions that we work with have been extremely successful. And, and um, not only in us doing our research projects, but also we've helped them uh, write over 33 community grants, get over half a million dollars for them to do projects in their communities. We don't get a penny of that. We, we just help them write those grants. The coalitions are staffed mainly by community people, as Vivian just mentioned, in various sectors. And, and uh, some healthcare providers, mostly nurses from health departments or health department uh, workers, administrators, they're the ones that are in the trenches and actually see, have a lot of passion, et cetera. So the problem with engaging, um, for example, doctors is that it is a healthcare professional shortage area. The physicians that are there, uh, many of them are from foreign countries, and don't, they don't understand the cultural issues that the community members deal with. And for them, the women would tell us, you know, we go to the doctor, we see the doctor, and, and then we see them in the grocery store two weeks later, and they ignore us. And to them, that's very, you know, an insult because they want to be treated as a person, not as that 
problem that came in to see them. So that causes a lot um, of cultural issues. We, and um, we also have providers who are suffering some of the same problems of the region. So there was one clinic that every spring when the creek would raise, would get flooded. And so, you know, we can do our medical record reviews there. Don't, I'm, why does it just, they just move. They don't have the economic capacity to pull up and move because they're suffering from the same eco economic problems. They can't stock enough HPV vaccine in their clinics because they have to pay out of pocket and either it will go unused or all the doses will not go used and they've, they lost out the money. And the last comment is that, uh, especially related to HPV, we have, I mentioned that some of the nurses are anti-vaccine. Well, we have at least one clinic that I know of, the whole clinic is anti-vaccine. They will not give any childhood vaccines or anything to any of their patients. So um, it's very interesting in terms of who are the providers there. And the provider who helped us with that free colposcopy clinic, it was not easy to get there. If any of you want to know the backstory, I'll, I'll tell you in private. Uh, one of the things, if I may add, is uh, kind of dovetailing on Dr. Paskett's uh, point is that in the Pacific, there's only a few indigenous physicians and the rest are from China, WHO brings in a lot of the physicians. And the ones that sometimes actually, you know, are the most problematic, to be real honest, are the American physicians. Because if you try to introduce something like VIA, they're the first ones to say, oh, that's such old technology. Nobody does that. You know, and they, they create this atmosphere of you're getting second-rate stuff and you should not go there. So I, I think you're right that the, uh, the practitioners have very powerful um, place there, but they kind of, they have to be brought on board both uh, culturally as well as where the science is now. And sometimes um, if they're not there, it, it, it makes, th it confuses things. Um, so two quick thoughts on this. One is that I think it's not only important um, who's giving the information, but the information as it appears on paper on screen. So um, when we first look at in Mexico, any of the brochures, and I've done this in many countries that are available to women about any kind of cancer, they're all white young Barbies with beautiful little breasts that I certainly never had when I was 25 and definitely don't have after a mastectomy. Now, when I'm looking at a population that is 60% overweight obese, dark brown, large breasted and have breastfed for many years, they see the picture of the Barbie and what they tell me is, that's some other kind of beast. But we don't look anything like this. This has nothing to do with us. Um, so even the, the images and the information we're sharing, first of all, has to be you know, geared to the population. But also, I mean, let's look at the real message that we're giving them. You know, what we're telling them is that if you don't look like a Barbie, you ain't really what you should be. And you know, I believe that to talk about these kinds of diseases, um, and to just make people feel that they're worthwhile, you have to help them to get over the idea that it's only what you're supposed to see in the mirror. You, know, you have to tell them that if you wake up without a breast every morning, you're still beautiful. Tasha? Yeah, great. Hi, uh, Tasha Moses with the Strategic Management Services. And uh, Dr. Powell Fox, I'm just really happy that you could come and speak about the um, US Pacific Islands. And having visited some myself personally and been involved with the work, I think this idea and this notion of cultural trauma and the work, just bringing it to a different population in a different environment, I think it's something that really permeates throughout low resource areas, not just in the Pacific Island jurisdictions, but also in the United States and on other continents. And I think it's something that practitioners, but also go non-governmental organizations need to really take into account before they think of entering into areas um, and saving the people. They have to think about this idea of cultural trauma. And so what recommendations do you as well as other panelists have for organizations, individuals, um, even policymakers um, and governments um, in thinking about cultural trauma before they apply or think to enter in um, to communities to try and help them. Just real briefly, uh, I think the first thing is uh, 
going into an area to definitely know the history and and you know the, about the people and their uh, their culture but also i think the most important thing and i find that it's, it's the hardest thing to do is know your own lens and know what your own biases are because i, I know that you know i was born and raised in hawaii and you know i i really went out to the pacific thinking that you know um the U.S. took care of everything, and it was going to be this pristine place, and all of a sudden it was something very different, but I had a lens. And then when I first went there, also it was, well, the people, they're not helping themselves. And that just sets you down the wrong path. But it, it, it's one of those things, understanding that lens and, um, and then how to work with it. But I, I think just knowing the history and knowing your own biases is probably the first place to start. So uh, I think that we need to train uh, folks a little better from the beginning. So I mentioned I teach medical students. They get one lecture on the social determinants of health by me. <laughs> right. They need more because I totally agree with this. You, you need to know the culture and the, and the, and the history and uh, what you're approaching. Um, you know, the, Mrs. Jones, that example I showed you, she was the first woman I interviewed when I was doing my doctoral dissertation. So you can imagine, you know, on this doctoral student, little doctoral student and out there, and she says, well, I'm not going to go back. Ugh. You know, what do I say to her? And the reason she wouldn't go back is because she said, I'm afraid that I'll have to have my womb removed, and then I will stop being a woman to my man. Exactly what, you know, Felicia said, exactly. So we need to educate people more about this. Anybody in any aspect of biomedical research, science, healthcare, needs to take a class. Not one lecture. I do my best in one lecture. But not one lecture before they do. And if they're going to go to another country, you know, to serve, for example, healthcare, professional shortage areas, they've got to be, you know, have more information and, and maybe select people who are interested in learning about who they serve and not just going there to serve because they have to pay off some years. Go ahead. I just add one other twist to this, that when we're thinking about cultural trauma, that within a country, it can be also a politically sensitive issue. And so it's not just foreigners, expatriates coming in. And when you are an expatriate coming in, you had better be pretty careful about how you raise these issues because there can be serious <coughs> political concerns around those issues in some countries. And, and you have to realize that for the people there who are trying to be sensitive, it's difficult for them as well. Um, they may come from a different tribe. They may come from a different religious group. And so it's, it's a really complicated issue that we all have to try and be more sensitive around but it's not so easy going in, even within the country, um, for people to deal with. Another question? Hi, I'm Arthi Patel Varanasi with Advancing Synergy. And my question, I first want to thank the panel because I learned a lot from listening to all of you. And I think this is a topic that doesn't never, there's not, there's always more that we can say and always more that we need to do. So it really helps, especially having the personal stories. Um, we just finished a study with 100 low-income breast cancer patients where we were using a technology-enabled platform to provide navigation services. And so my question surrounds, and, and our whole premise was the idea of using technology to leverage limited resources. And in this era of e-health and m-health and all the other you know, kind of electronic things and social media. What role do you see technology playing in the communities that you currently serve and also playing in the future as, we, as we're looking toward the future of cancer prevention and control? A oh, wonderful question. So, um, you know, people think in the Appalachia region that we've taken care of the digital divide. That's a myth, okay? We have not taken care of the digital divide. And we actually did a, a, an e-health intervention in churches in five Appalachian states. And um, I personally was in the church basement recruiting folks, you know, doing the eligibility form, hot, using the hotspot on my uh, smartphone, and in the middle, lost the internet. So, um, you know, it's not, we're not there yet. 
we, we can't deliver these whiz-bang e-health technology. And it has nothing to do with my lack of technological capacity saying this. It's, it's true. And it's, it's unfortunate. And those barriers make people who you're trying to help lef, less receptive to what you're trying to do. And so, you know, the community tells us billboards because we don't have access to the internet. Not all of us can afford smartphones. Um, and, you know, they still do dial-up. I can tell you lots of stories of the mm -hmm. dial-up that, that went on in the churches to, to access the computers. It's a huge problem. And I'm wondering if it's going to cause even more of a divide. And, and that was my question. Is it going to, you know, we're trying to address health disparities, but are we actually creating more? Well, one of the things in the Pacific that I found was actually uh, amazing. And uh, though there's a digital divide there, because there is such an oral culture and because they like stories, as you mentioned, they love Facebook. The ones who can get on Facebook, <laughs> it, that's how they, they talk between because they move a lot and some, you know, they can migrate back and forth to the United States, but they use Facebook. So I think using appropriate technology, recognizing that there is a digital divide, that if you can apply it to how the people react, and reading stuff is definitely not their, their, their thing. And seeing images that don't look like them, that doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just on, a moment on the treatment side, though. Um, I don't think there the biggest barrier is whether or not there's good access to internet. I think it's the fact that specialists typically refuse to talk to primary care physicians. I mean, it was relatively easy to get Dana-Farber to work with pediatricians in Rwanda and provide care for kids with cancer. It is still impossible for me to get oncologists in Mexico City to speak to even general oncologists in Cuernavaca that's an hour and a half away so that the woman doesn't have to go to that hospital for care. And there are two reasons. One is that they don't have time to do that, supposedly. They, they talk to specialists. You're at a different mm -hmm. level, right? And the other is that the money for the care is centered in the tertiary level institutions. We have not figured out how to have the money follow people. And I'm a firm believer in the fact that a huge proportion of cancer care could be done in primary or secondary levels. If we can do it with hemodialysis, I don't understand why we can't do it with chemo. I mean, radish, RT is a different story, but chemo? I would just, on a more hopeful note, <laughs> um, I, I think internet is still a, a big challenge. I, I think about Africa, for example, and um, there, are, there is more access, but it's in urban areas, and it's among those who have the money to have access. But I do think there's a lot of hope from um, mobile phones, from cell phones. And it is incredible to me. I mean, I think back to 20 years ago, or even 15 years ago in Western Kenya, where there were five landlines in the, in the district we were working in. And, and three years later, after the cell towers had been built, Everybody had a, a cell phone. And so the idea of getting messages out by SMS, for example, if you were doing um, HPV testing and you need to get the results back to women, you don't want to ask them to come back in, get agreement to have a message, and you have to be careful what that message is so that it's private, maybe coded. Um, you could potentially get messages back to women about their HPV results. Um, to know whether they need to actually come into a clinic or not. I think the potential there for simple use of SMS is just tremendous, and it's, it's amazing how quickly it's spreading. So I think there is some hope that these technologies can help overcome some of these other barriers we're talking about, but they have to be used really in a careful way. And I also heard a number of you speak about um, the resources and trying to get enough people in to help in these areas. Some of you talked about leveraging um, other uh, nurses and other people that could provide some of this care, especially related to navigation. Um, but when you actually get to the actual testing and procedures, is there a thought to involve more advanced practice nurses for colonoscopies or colposcopies or things like that? in some of the areas, low resource areas? I'm thinking of the IOM's Future of Nursing report. 
Well, we've already for, I think, probably the last 15 years been using nurses to do cryotherapy. And, um, and there are certainly places that have trained some nurses um, in, in more um, higher level referral centers to do colposcopy. Um, so I think that's a tremendous resource and we do need to rely on those mid-level providers because where there aren't doctors, there aren't specialists, and, and there are many things that well-trained people can do without having specialty training. So I think that's a great resource. Are there any other questions? All right, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so I'd like to thank once again all of our eloquent speakers and the diverse topics that were presented. And so many examples and lessons learned. So I would just like to remind folks to please return at 1.30 for session three. Thank you and enjoy your lunch. <laughs>